who is a better author, Ryan Foland or Leonard Kim? <laughs> Hands down, Leonard Kim, without a question. Uh, he is by far the stronger writer of the two, and my claim comes in the speaking realm. So where uh, where he makes up for me in the writing perspective, I can help to support him from the speaking perspective. And I think writing is one of the most challenging things, aside from speaking, that is. And that's because you really have to keep attention without anything other than a series of words. And I think we're just so desensitized. And one of the things that he's done really well uh, is helping to, to craft the stories that we have in Ditch the Act in a way that actually feel really conversational. And I tell people, write like you speak and speak like you write. And I'm better at one of those than the other. But yeah, definitely he takes the bag on that. <laughs> That's cool. So before we dive right into your, your book, can you just give us a, a little brief rundown of what's brought you to this moment in your career? Yeah, well, it was a, a fateful day when I found out about a party that I didn't get invited to and, you know, felt bad about myself and then found out later that my buddy who told me about it couldn't go and gave me the ticket to this party. So it's kind of like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, that golden ticket that you think you have, but you just don't have. And then somebody hands you the golden ticket. You're like, oh, my God. And it was at a time where I was really trying to get serious about what I was doing. Like many people, I was doing a lot of activity, but there was nothing that was happening from it. I wrote 50 blogs that summer. Nobody read them. I was making videos. Nobody cared. I was trying to get people to follow me on social and they just didn't, it just, it just didn't, nothing worked. And this party was at Keith Ferrazzi's house. Now, are you familiar with Keith Ferrazzi? Just from the intro in your book, yes. Okay. But if you can explain who he is, that would so, be great. So you should definitely, it's a must read for his first book called Never Eat Alone. And it's really a book about how you are stronger with the people you surround yourselves with. And he was one of the youngest CMOs at a Fortune 500 company and has an amazing story himself. But he was really became known for like the, the godfather of networking. And he would bring these people to his house and open up his house and they'd have a wine party and they would really get to know each other. And he's big on a lot of candor and just sort of really, he essentially is like, someone who ditches the act. Now, I didn't know this at the time. I had read that book. I also read Who's Got Your Back. And I was like, oh my gosh, this guy, I can't wait to meet him. And it's supposed to be this exclusive entrepreneurial networking event. So I, I, I go up there and it's in the Hollywood Hills. I've never been in a cooler house. It's got like mm -hmm. seven different layers. It's got balconies. It overlooks the Hollywood Hills. There was a guy who's playing uh, an oboe or something that was dressed in a cloud suit. Everything was fancy. Drinks were strong. People were looking fresh, and I was rocking a knitted bow tie. What's okay? wrong with that? <laughs> a knitted bow tie. This is because I was uh, I was working running the entrepreneurship center at UCI at the time, and one of the student groups they had custom knitted uh, like pieces of clothing, but like with the bow tie, they actually would put the bow tie on a bust of Lincoln, and they'd let it sit there for a couple of days, like absorbing the energy of Lincoln, and then they'd sell it. So I was just supporting the students. I'm like, I got to stand out a little bit. So I have a, a knitted bow tie. So I show up to this party and I didn't know anybody, but I'm meeting people who work at Google. I'm meeting people who flew in from other places of the world just to be there that night. And I'm like super just intimidated. I'm going, yeah, okay, I'm in Toastmasters and nobody yeah. follows me on social media. <laughs> so I, I listened. Now, Keith brought everybody into the room. There's about 70 people. And he said, put your phones away. Everybody shut your phones down for a minute. I want to share something. And then he shared something that was really personal. And everybody was like, oh, damn. Did he just, did, oh, okay, interesting. And at that moment, I even kind of feel it now. Like I just, there's this weird like connection to him. Like, I can't believe you just trusted me to share that. Okay. And he was like, the feeling that you feel right now is true connection. And you only connect with people when you share what doesn't go right. And he said, what we're going to do is you're all going to be assigned a plate on the bottom of the plate is a number. And you're going to sit at one of these seven different tables. And instead of saying, here's where everything is going right, you're going to explain what's going wrong professionally and personally. So here's all these rock star people sitting around a table, like instructed to say what's going wrong. And this is crazy. So, there's a, a, at my table, it was my turn. I stood up. The only person that stood up, and that's the Toastmaster in me, and I'm standing now. And I explained. I said, I wrote 50 blogs. Nobody reads them. Nobody wants my videos, blah, blah, blah. 
you know, personally, I, I don't have uh, really a lot of issues, but then explain some of the challenges of at the time, whether I should get, do the engaged and, and get married kind of thing, but I was in a healthy relationship. I'm like, I'm just, I'm just confused. So everybody goes around the table and they all have unique issues. And this one guy stands up and says, well, um, I've got 10 million reads on my content and I have all these people that are reaching out to me to speak and I don't want anything to do with them because I don't really, I'm not a confident speaker and my girlfriend just broke up with me. So I'm pretty miserable right now. And I'm just kind of a grumpy person. And of all the people I'm like, I could probably help that guy out. <laughs> uh, I've got game. I can help him get a girl and a, speaking's my gig. So like I can help him get confident. I went up afterwards. I'm like, I'm Ryan. I met you at the table. I'll help you if you help me. That was my first words to Leonard. And he's like, okay. And we randomly ran each in, to each other in Santa Monica a couple weeks later. We're like, Hey, that's that same person. Like, okay, let's get serious. And then that was really the start of what led me to ditching the act. And he and I became business partners. We became friends. Uh, we started influence tree. And then when we got approached by different publications to write a book, we actually called Keith Razi. This is two years later. We're like, Hey Keith, you, we know you're the master connector. Just heads up. We actually met at your party because of what you did. Uh, we started a business. We have a successful business. We're going to write a book. Would you mind if we came and hung out at your house for a day to really sketch out and brainstorm what the book would be? We want to like channel that energy. And he's like, sure. By the way, I'm going to this, uh, this comic event later on in the night. If you guys want to join, we're like, Oh my God. So we went over to his house. We spent the whole day. We became more friends with him. We started to support him and what he's doing. He decided to write the forward and it all kind of came in together, but it was the, it was a very fateful random night at that one table. Uh, in that one situation. And it's, uh, it's been amazing since then. Wow. That's that. It's, it's such a, such a, a, a great story. And, and I think now's a perfect time to go on to talk about the book because that is almost the intro, you know, Leonard gives his intro and, and, and is very open about his life in the book, which is so interesting. And you give yours again, which is equally as interesting, but tell us what the book it ditch the act is all about. It's about learning how to become comfortable in your own skin and realizing that when you get comfortable, that's the way that you can actually stand out. And I tell people that if here is the deal, let me give it to you real. The key to connection is to learn to be real because everyone's different, but we're all the same. And to be perfectly imperfect, that's how you win the game. So if you only showcase good and do not share the bad, you will miss connections that you never knew you had. And here I was coming from a situation, trying to build a brand, trying to be like, I'm an amazing speaker. And people are like, get out of here. I'm like, look at all these articles I'm writing. They're like, get out of here. Anything I'd share would be like, look at me, look at me. And people are like, get out of here. And Leonard really helped me realize that owning my gingerness, owning my loudness, owning my awkwardness, owning the mistakes along the way, and actually, taking some of the scariest skeletons from my closet that I was trying to sort of cover up with all this other stuff is actually a big part of who I am. And when people realize what I've gone through, they actually maybe have the same feeling that I had when uh, I met Keith Ferrazzi for the first time and he really opened up to me. And so at the end of the day, it's a, it's a business book that helps you realize you as a person, you are your own business. And people don't want to do business with businesses. They want to do business with people mm -hmm. and people are fallible and people stub their toes. I was, uh, I was hunting lobsters this weekend and I gaffed myself. I, I, I misplaced a gaff on the boat, a big old hook. And I gaffed, I gaffed a huge chunk out of my heel. I also put my wetsuit on backwards. All kinds of other things went wrong. And it's like, though, those are the fun, funny things that like before I would be scared of, of sharing. But now I'm like, yeah, when you, when you don't, when the knee pads are on the back of your knees and your buddy gives you crap after you've got all of your scuba gear on, that's when you know <laughs> you've learned. So it's, it's really just about being okay with being where you're at and who you're at as a way to stand out. And you and I have, have had lots of great conversations of mm -hmm. how hard it is to create that messaging, but sometimes it's right there in the face and we want to yeah. give people the confidence and worksheets and, and steps to actually do that. Absolutely. And, and you're the first person on this podcast to rap as well, which is, <laughs> you know, if, if that doesn't make it into the second book, I, I don't know what will. 
<laughs> perfect, perfect, perfect. No, you know, and I don't think, uh, and, and rapping is a form of ditching the act. You really like, I wrap up on stage and like people look at me like, what the hell are you doing? But I just keep going. And then it, it, it's just all about owning your whole story. Yeah. And just, just on that, I think it, it, it might be an English thing, but I think the American accent is primed for rapping. Whereas the, <laughs> the English one is more, we can do poetry, but that, well, that's about as far as we go. Yeah, like dramatic reading, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, fantastic. That, that leads me on to uh, another question, which you, you alluded to when you were talking that, and that, that, that it's not just a book. There's lots of activities to get you involved when you're reading the book. Yeah. When people buy it, and they're going to, uh, uh, I'll make sure they do, but how do you suggest they tackle uh, these? Is it reading the whole book? stopping halfway through, getting people involved. How would you say they, they tackle these while reading so, it? So we suggest to fill out the worksheets along the way. And you'll find that after the worksheet, if you flip through the very beginning, it will say something to the extent of, are you sure you went back and like, really consider going back and doing that worksheet because they're all foundational and building blocks. One of the things that we find with our clients and people who we just want to help is that they're doing the right things, but they're doing them in the wrong order. And if you don't go through the exposure resume, which we have to mm -hmm. actually tease out the skeletons that you're hiding, that you're afraid people will judge you for and how to position those into learning lessons so that your experience becomes your expertise, then you're not going to set yourself up for really opening up with an authentic bio and having an authentic bio is the, the most important digital document you have, but you have to have gone through the work to mm -hmm. find out what it is that you haven't shared yet. And then using the 313 challenge to lock down your messaging now that you have these and then building stories around our story worksheet and then building a content calendar with a content calendar worksheet. And all of these things are sequential in a way. So if somebody wants to, if they don't have the time to really dig in, then I'm sure that they can go back because it still reads well without doing the worksheets, mm -hmm. but it's almost like the book is the car and the worksheet is the key. And you can get in the car. You'd be like, this is an amazing car. Look at all these, look, you know, look at, look at the leather and all oh, it's great. And or it's even kind of funky and it's a seventies, it's retro, whatever car it is. But in order to actually start that engine and go, you have to put in the work. So it's like this blend between business and self-help when it's just sort of following these guidelines. And one example is this brand positioning and strategy worksheet. And I'll, I've done a lot of talks in the, in the past month or so building up to it. And I'll bring this out and I'll challenge people to work through it. And so many people will say or, or ask about how do I grow my following? Like, how do I gain more followers? Ryan, how do you have so many followers? But one of the questions is, how many followers do you want? Mm -hmm. And they're like, I, I don't know. I'm like, if you don't know, how are you going to know when you've even reached your goal? Like, is five or 10 or 10,000? So it's like, there's just something powerful of being forced in the nicest way possible to start to make some of these decisions that then actually will lead you to where you want to be. So we yeah. kind of take the excuse out from under you by giving it to you. Yeah. And I mean, we've had, we've had multiple conversations where you put me in very difficult situations <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it, 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 you feel better for it. And it, it's a case of, if you don't go through those, you don't necessarily know if you can go through them first and foremost and, and what's at the other side. And it, you know, I, I, I thank you, dearly for putting me in those situations because it's just those you don't you generally don't get to meet people that do it for themselves put themselves in those awkward situations they almost yeah. need a little push yeah because it's so easy not to put yourself in those situations yeah just like a, a trainer to gym you're always gonna you're always gonna work out harder if you have more structure and somebody who's pushing you and counting the reps it's actually kind of an interesting concept i was working out with a buddy when i was in boston and you know, we were working out together and he was setting up the scene, setting up the rotation. And then he was like there with me. He's like, all right, one, two. And I kind of felt awkward. I'm like, I, I can do this. But then I was <laughs> like, wait a minute. He's like, just helping me do the best. And I found myself doing more and doing them better. And it's mm -hmm. like, it, it, it really helps when people push you and force you to make some of those decisions that you've been avoiding, or you've just made a, a mark in a pencil hoping that it's enough to move forward instead of making it sharpie marker. Yeah. Always the sharpie marker. Absolutely. 
just I just want to take a step back for a second onto something that you mentioned there. <laughs> come back, come back. <laughs> I, I, I'm sat down, so that was the wrong tone of phrase there, to be fair. I'm just, let's just lean back for a second. That's better. Um, <laughs> can, you, can you talk us through your 313 model? Because you, I'm currently in the process of developing this, and it's, it, it's amazing. Um, so I just want everybody to know what the heck this is all about. And this is just part of what you do. But it's, yeah. it's fundamental, I think. So at the end of the day it's based on a premise that nobody actually cares what you do. And that's where you have to start because you might feel like people care what you do because our entire life has been, Ryan, what do you want to do when you grow up? And when you grow, you get to college, what, what major do you want? What job do you want? Everything's focused on what you do. But in reality, I argue that people don't care what you do. Hmm. Instead, they care about the problem that you solve. And we all have problems and we all need different problems solved. So inherently, you're not going to have to solve everybody's problem because you're not for everyone. And so once you're okay with that as a foundation, then you can understand the value of being able to explain the problem that you solve without saying what you do. Because if you can get that as a core concept, the next time somebody asks you what you do, you're like, it doesn't really matter what I do. What matters is the problem that I solve. Now they're going to ask you, what problem do you solve? And now you can filter through the other information. And the 313 stands for your ability to explain what you do in three sentences, one sentence, and ultimately three words. And it's really a, a core messaging to make a decision on what is the one problem that you solve? What is your one solution? And who is the target market that needs you? And <laughs> Do not confuse simple with easy. And you can attest to this. It's just mind boggling when you have to put yourself into this little box. You're like, no, no, but I do this. No, no. From a communication standpoint, when you are tactical about the way that you explain what you do in terms of the problem that you solve, it gets people interested in what you do in a way that you can't necessarily originate otherwise. And if you have a business or if you, uh, if you are an employee or if you're a manager, our whole life is selling these different ideas or, or what we're trying to do. But if you reverse engineer and just focus on the problem, the solution, the market in a particular way, it gives you an arsenal or a tool. You're in like a video game, like Fortnite, and you have all these different weapons that you've, you've got strapped and like at a push of a button, you can say what you do in a sentence and then psh, comes over and it's hand hand combat. And you're talking about, uh, think of me as this of this. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's a, it's a challenge. And in fact, I have a podcast called the 313 challenge where I work people through this process, simple questions with very difficult answers. But once you answer them, you're like, there it is. That, yep. That's it right there. And so in the book, we talk about how from a branding standpoint, people don't really care that you're a speaker, but they care about the problem that you solve while you're speaking. And so by teasing that out and being able to get that core communication down, like you just all of a sudden become free of that scramble when somebody asks you what you do and you're like, but, um, no, I didn't say that. And you go home and you're like, so it gives you some bumper bumpers in the bowling lane when it comes to trying to strike out in the conversations that you have. And I'll put that link in the show notes to the, the, uh, the video where you are talking someone through the 313 model because it, it gave me comfort in knowing that I wasn't the only one to when you when you ask, okay, what's the problem that you solve? They're a little bit, uh, well, I, I do this and, and I can provide this and we do this for them and you're bored already. And I go, that's what you do, not the problem that you solve. So there's lots of burn, but it's a, <laughs> I, I say it's a tough love. It's a psh, 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 psh. And, and you know, last time you did that, that stuck with me. So every time that I think about, okay, how can I make this better? I think, no, it's, it's tough love. It's just tough love. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, okay, Ryan, I want to go into some quick fire questions now because you've sure. filled on the book. We've gone through 313 model. So hopefully this is a bit, bit, bit quicker and a bit, less, yes, absolutely. Knuckles at the ready. You can't, you can't hide though. You need a buzzer for this, I think. I'm, I'm working <laughs> You can't hide. Okay, please come, 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 come back. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, right. <laughs> Serious time. Kind of. Uh, name one must-read business book. Four-hour work week. What was the last thing you Googled? How to cook a lobster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you told that story previously, and that's, that would have been a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> uh, what would be the one tip for people who are studying? To... And, and this is something that worked for me is to reward yourself. And for me, one example is that when I would get through a large paper that I have to do, I would take peanut M&Ms and I'd line them up on the top of the keyboard. Okay. Like at the end of the day, like it's risk and reward, right? It's, it's, it's all about that. So I would get through a certain, I'd say, all right, every two pages I can have an M&M. So I'd be like, Brr, oh, God, ah, mm, oh, that's good. I'm going to do it again. And when it comes to, if you're not writing a paper, it's about celebrating those little victories and sort of rewarding yourself. So I have a tendency or had a tendency to like, okay, you get this, this win, you get the two pages down or you get the speaking gig. You're like, okay, cool. Now what? But you have to stop and be like, woo, I got it. Right. And so celebrating your wins and, and taking the time to do that is going to create the space to let your brain work because a stressed brain is not a creative brain. I oh, love it. Absolutely love it. If you could tell your 10 year old self one thing, what would it be? Wear more sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because I know when I'm 60, I'm going to be like, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I say that because my the back of my, if I look a little lobsterish, it's that's because I've been hunting lobsters and the back of my neck I, is very red from, from being in the water for hours. But yes. <laughs> so they usually say that the uh, people look like the dogs or dogs look like people <laughs> whatever you've been catching over the week yeah I, I look like a, I look like a ginger lobster for sure <laughs> brilliant I love it okay okay right final question this should be an easy one um if people want to find out about you by the book all that kind of stuff how can they find you so they can find me at ryan.online nice and easy right brilliant. Ditch the act go to ditch the act.com that's it oh okay a bit more there, but there you go. I <laughs> know that, that's perfect. It, it couldn't be easier. So there you go. Um, for people that are audio, Ryan's got ditched the act on his forehead, and it's not because he used sunscreen to write ditch the act. It's actually stuck into his forehead because <laughs> that's the guy he is, and he's amazing and superb. And I thank him so so much for being on this podcast. Absolute pleasure. People going by the book, you won't regret it. And about halfway through it, scribbling notes all the way through it. It's just amazing stuff. Um, Ryan, thank you so, so much for joining me. Absolute pleasure. All right. And one question for you. If you had to describe yourself in the fewest amount of words possible, what would you describe yourself as? Oh, without a doubt, I am the Lego master of marketing. Brilliant. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. All right. Adios. <laughs>